So to start off, um, I'm really curious, uh, why nonprofit? How did you end up as CTOs of nonprofits? And what did you tell your mother when you took the jobs at uh, nonprofits? Oliver, you want to start? Uh, my career was, was, didn't start in nonprofits. Uh, and in fact, DonorShoes.org is my first and only uh, nonprofit. And I think, it's, I think it's not uncommon of uh, the folks in our CTOs for Good group. Um, and I think, like many of you, I was looking for a little more meaning, a little more direct social impact. Could I work all day uh, and be feeling good about all day being, helping and make the world a little better? Uh, and I feel like I got lucky. I found that organization at the intersection of the, the technology that I care about and social impact. And, uh, and it's great. I feel like I have the best job in the world. I get to do the tech stuff I love and, and feel great about the impact at the end of the day. Uh, I started my career in probably the largest nonprofit there was in the U.S. Navy. So, um, <laughs> uh, and I think for me, it's after 30 plus years of doing technology management, um, I was really at a place where I wanted to do something I felt good about. Uh, and about, I think it's 15 years now, uh, I was actually diagnosed with uh, advanced breast cancer and uh, was not given a great prognosis. Uh, but went to a, uh, an experimental program at MD Anderson, and, you know, science kind of saved my life. So when the opportunity came up at the Public Library of Science to further that and make sure that research can be open uh, and accessible, I really jumped at the chance. So I've spent a lot of time in the for-profit world, but right after college, I joined UNICEF Pakistan and spent a couple of years out there working with kids, and I just felt the impact that one could have in that kind of environment at that time, like 500 kids a day were dying of dysentery. Uh, so it just really stuck in my mind, and even after working uh, as a, you know, running a web design firm, and Common Sense Media was one of our clients, after about 10 years there and you know, working at the creation of that org, I just ended up joining, and I just feel the impact side of it is really what motivated me to sort of leave the for-profit world and, and join a nonprofit. So Oliver, you mentioned this a little bit. There's this super secretive group that's never made a public appearance before <laughs> called CTOs for Good. This is the first time you've been on stage together. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what CTOs for Good is? And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like Revenge of the Nerds. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, us nerds are just sick of you jocks <laughs> making all the decisions. And no, that's not it. Uh, so if we, CTOs for Good is uh, 19 organizations. Uh, we think of as some of the most tech forward nonprofits in the world. And uh, the folks that lead engineering at those organizations get together, and we share information really openly with each other. We help each other. We solve problems together. Uh, even the tough ones where we don't know the answers, uh, at least we realize that everybody else is wrestling with the same thing, and, and we try our best to help each other. So it's uh, DonorShoes.org, Common Sense, Public Library of Science, and then a lot of the <laughs> orgs that you've heard from uh, yesterday and today, like Kiva, Global Giving, uh, Let's See, Charity Water, Wikipedia, Watsi. Uh, code.org, Code for America, others. It's a, it's a great group, and uh, one of the things we, we say is that we uh, like to not reinvent wheels, um, and, and so we don't feel like we're doing this alone. In a sense, we feel like as a sector, we, we get to kind of do this together. And I, and I see it as one of the great perks of our sector, uh, which is that I don't know that you can have a group quite like this in the private sector with the amount of, of uh, secrecy that high technology companies require even when you're talking about challenges that really are not special sauce, they're really generic things that, uh, you know, fighting spam or uh, th these things that people should be collaborating on, uh, it, it doesn't always happen because the bias is, well, don't share, just be careful, don't say anything. And one of the great perks of our sector is that, you know, we all embrace transparency as a, as a strategy, and so it, I think it comes much more naturally for all of us to to share and collaborate. Yeah, that's really I, interesting. I, oh, I would also say that I'm one of the newer members of the group. Um, and one of the things that Oliver impressed upon me, and I think all the new members, uh, is this isn't just a, oh, you know, kind of show up on the list or serve every once in a while uh, type of thing. This really, truly is a commitment. We, we ask people to make a commitment to get together physically, uh, either on the East Coast or the West Coast, once a year. Uh, there's time commitment. Um, I can tell you after, I think this is my second year uh, on this, if I have a question uh, or something and I post it, 
Uh, within five to 10 minutes, there are at least four or five people within this group that really respond. Uh, they're very active. Uh, I feel very safe with the group so that I can you know, air some dirty laundry if I need to and get some help. Uh, and, and I think those are kind of the values that, that he started the group with that have been extremely helpful. Yeah, that's really incredible. I can't imagine in the for-profit world there are 19 CTOs collaborating in this way. That sounds like a really important dis difference between the nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector, that you have all these backgrounds in um, you know, government, for-profit, and nonprofit. Are there other similarities or differences that you find between or among the, the you know, in, in the tech world? I mean, you mean the for-profit and non-profit? I mean, yeah, I think like this transparency is really interesting, right? Yeah. In the collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think it's actually spawned groups like COOs for good and C DevOps for good. So it's actually from the CTOs, other people in management have picked this thread up uh, as well. Yeah, it's great. There's and also uh, CMOs for good. Our colleagues yeah. are collaborating and really sharing amazing data. So, for example. You know, uh, obviously the, the discipline of, of uh, testing changes, whether it's email or website changes, is, is, is now pretty universal. Uh, but still, all of us have limited resources. So what fo groups like ours and CMOs for Good will do is, is they'll run a, an A-B test, whether it's email or on the, on the website, and then they'll share the results with their colleagues. And imagine that, like 10 to 19 other orgs learning from, from the test you just ran instead of themselves all running the same experiments and maybe wasting time. And, and so you, I think you really do, across now operations, marketing, and uh, the tech side as well, you get sort of a collective intelligence. But to answer the direct question of, you know, kind of uh, is managing a technology organization vastly different mm -hmm. between doing that in a for-profit versus a not-for-profit? Um, this is my first not-for-profit gig, and I would have to say that probably 95% is the same. It's absolutely the same. Uh, we really have the same challenges, uh, the same limitations, uh, the same pressures uh, that I have found in most for-profit organizations as well. But I would say that it's maybe 95% of the work <coughs> is the same, but the beginning and the end are different. At the very beginning, you may or may not have less or more resources, but you have more opportunities. So you have to be really careful about where you actually invest and put your resources. And the feeling of satisfaction at the very end is, I think, much greater than in the for-profit world. And there's, that really keeps you know, organizations like ours flourishing. Well, yeah, so that's interesting. So then, like, as you think about not just like managing the team and the infrastructure, but like as CTOs of nonprofits, where you're thinking about impact as the ultimate metric, um, if for profits are measuring um, just like user growth as the chart, uh, maybe profit, how does uh, being a, how is being CTO of a nonprofit different in that context when you're, when, when the ultimate goal is this is impact and so we have traffic metrics and conversions and donations and a lot of stuff that's really the same. But there's stuff like decisions impacted is one of our big metrics. So we really work on that and have to make the user experience support that. So you have different kinds of metrics that you work with or schools registered and things like that. So you have a different set, but you still have numbers and it's still a bit of a numbers game to you know, do what you do. Yeah, even though it's a mission driven uh, type of organization, it still comes down to uh, what are the metrics that drive that mission uh, and you know, making sure that you get clarity about what that end game is uh, that you're trying to move towards is, is absolutely critical. All right, I'm gonna ask one more question and I'll open it up to all of you. But I'm really curious, so there are some people here that we really hope are gonna found tech nonprofits, but I think um, there's uh, also a number that may be a potential board candidates. Um, they're work at tech companies or have tech backgrounds um, that are thinking about uh, ways to, to give back um, and that their experience might resonate really well um, with that of an approach of tech nonprofits. What advice do you have for people who are thinking about getting more involved in tech nonprofits but from an advisory capacity? Yeah, this, 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 comes, uh, this has come up incidentally uh, but often uh, in, in group discussions and I guess my, uh, one key piece of advice I would convey is to make sure that you have diversity on your board across disciplines, and in particular, that you have technology and product represented there. Uh, if you were on a for-profit board, I think you would assume you would do that, but for some reason, nonprofit boards, perhaps, perhaps because of the history of them, 
are different. I mean, for many nonprofits, traditional ones, the board is really just a fundraising arm, right? I mean, that's why you have these 30, 40, 50 person boards, because each of them are on the hook to go raise a certain amount of money to get people to the gala, to sit at the, the, the rubber chicken dinner table. And, uh, and, but but that's, not, that's not how I think tech forward nonprofits are run. They're smaller boards, that's good. Um, and so we have, I, don't, I won't mention any names, but they're, they're orgs that we know of where uh, they have, like in the Bay Area, all techies on the board. And you know what? That's not good. And they have problems like, well, if, if we're not growing like Uber or LinkedIn or Facebook, then this thing is a flop. And it's like, no, that's not, those are, those are once in a lifetime grand slams. We're measuring different things here. We're doing different things. Then we have other uh, organizations that we work with that are, for example, not in the Bay Area, and they have no techies on the board, no product people. And uh, that's, I think, a little bit crazy. And as you can imagine, things get much harder for people in our position when you've got no one on the board at the governance level who's, who's run an engineering organization, built a product, shipped anything. And I have to tell you, at DonorShoes.org, we have, we, at this point, we have really good balance, and I feel really fortunate for it. And there are just some things that come up where board members like Fred Wilson or Jeff Wiener of LinkedIn uh, just save us so much time because they've lived this, they've done this, and something that could waste an entire board meeting somewhere else debating cost. Why do I have to pay this engineer so much? You know, why, why are the, what is this metric? It looks really low. And then these folks say, no, no, no. That, that, that's what these people cost, and that metric is typical. Like, let's move on. And you just saved yourself a couple hours, a couple quarters of, of running in circles. So uh, my main message there is it's about balance and diversity and making sure you have representation on the product engineering side. Plus one. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I think there's incredible opportunity for people in the tech sector to join nonprofit boards and bring that way of thinking and just find a cause that is interesting and find an organization I think you can be helpful. Even organizations like ours could use more tech people because I think that's just a big help. All right, so we have now uh, the first ever access to three of the 19 members of the CTOs <laughs> for Good group. So i um, going to open up for audience questions. Um, any questions? Yes. Get this gentleman a microphone. <laughs> I'm an audience plant because I'm in CTOs for good. Ah. I'm mad for him to do something. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, and I'm, I'm, in, I'm in New York, all these folks are in San Fran. How are you finding the recruiting scene and has it changed since, say, January 20th? Uh, I, recruiting tech talent is really easy in the Bay Area, Matt. So if you're, if you're wrestling with that at all in New York, I think you must be doing something wrong, because it's, it's easy out here. You hire engineers, they just show up. <laughs> Sal yeah, salaries are low. It's, I think that's a localized problem you, you're wrestling with. It's good to know, thanks. No, but we, we, it's a good question. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's... Uh, I've hired in both uh, in this area, and uh, they're, you know, they have equal challenges, but one of the things that we've done as an organization is that we have our own recruiter uh, who understands our DNA, who understands our mission, um, and quite frankly, there are a lot of people out there who have worked at a lot of failed startups or, uh, you know, kind of uninteresting types of technology, and uh, so we try and go out and find people who want to make a change. Uh, and who really, you know, get the ethos and the mission that we're trying to accomplish. There's a lot of people who, you know, kind of got their undergraduate degrees, including myself, uh, in science fields, but didn't really have an opportunity to work uh, in scientific fields. Uh, and so we go after certain profiles of folks, uh, and, uh, you know, we've been relatively successful. Uh, I think uh, one of the things that Matt had mentioned to me uh, earlier was since the election, there seems to be a little more uh, interest in people wanting to do something uh, that makes a difference out there. So uh, for those of you who uh, may want to beat that drum uh, and uh, use that as a recruiting tool, I think that might be very effective. It takes us an average of six months to hire a good engineer. 
and about out of our 24 people product engineering team, almost half now are not in the Bay Area anymore. Maybe they started here, they moved somewhere else. So by having this dispersed team and using technology and video chat to stay in touch has really been the way we've sort of stayed on top of it. But I think tech recruiting remains incredibly difficult and it's a challenge and you have to have some kind of perk or mission that really lets people uh, adhere to your org. What's the, what's the reason for tech, uh, CTOs for good at 19 members? Why not scale it to hundreds, thousands? I couldn't hear that. What was the second half Sorry. of the question? Why not scale, uh, why not other nonprofits joining CTOs for good? Because I would, <laughs> think, I would think any nonprofit today requires tech and they can get, uh, they can use the sound advice and information from CTOs good. I think one part of it is that uh, we're, we want organizations of a similar profile. Uh, so so for uh, organizations that deliver their social impact through a technology product, uh, and also organizations of, of roughly similar stage. So if you're two people in a garage and you're still getting going, uh, we, we want to figure out ways to help those organizations. And we do so, for example, by collaborating with the fast forward folks. Uh, but. The, but it, it might not be the best fit when sitting down with 19 folks at organizations that are further along. Uh, what I would say is that, is that, we, is that I, I, there, there is no magic here, and you guys can all do this. And what you need is just executive and, uh, some executive air cover to let, give you the time and the, and, and the bandwidth and the networking to find your peers at these other orgs. And, there's no magic, just connect with them and it starts with coffee and asking each other questions and sharing openly about things you're wrestling with. And, and uh, so, so I think that we are gonna stay relatively small because it's all about trust and it's all about openness in the group. Uh, but, that, but, but I would encourage all of you to essentially make your own and create your own connections and, and help each other in that way because the, the, there's no magic. It's just about finding folks in similar roles at orgs that uh, are, are all after social impact and connecting those folks, and I think good things happen. Actually, Oliver's inspired us at Fast Forward to start a list, and we have a list now of the tech nonprofit founders uh, and leaders um, that communicate with each other. And then we've also set up a bigger, um, more open group uh, for tech nonprofits on Facebook that actually has uh, even more activity where people are always asking technical, technical and non-technical questions. Um, you know, one thing I'll just add is I do think, I, uh, CJ alluded to this, one, one, I do think part of our secret sauce is that we get together once a year and we work together in person face to face and real relationships are formed, real connections are made and real trust is built and not because we're doing trust falls or, or like, <laughs> special nonprofit-y, like singing together with acoustic <laughs> guitar. It's, it's just that when you've, when you've worked with someone face-to-face, -face, it's a different relationship in terms of responsiveness and trust than if it's just an email list. So my encouragement is, that's why I said, you know, start, start with a human connection and work from there. Uh, and, and sometimes with digital only, there's a risk that you don't get the, you don't get the level of engagement. Um, Can you guys hear me? Great. Uh, my name is Lily Beth Genghis. I'm the Chief Tech Community Officer of the Caper Center. So I actually, as a hardcore hardware, former hardware and software engineer, one of the things that I've been able to see working in Oakland specifically is that the implications and consequences that tech has in displacement and the skills building gap. So I was curious to see if that could be a topic for the CTOs for Good retreat. Happy to go and, and join you all. Uh, <laughs> But um, I think it's a, re a reality, right? For me, sometimes, um, as, as, a, as a lover of tech and AI and all those great things, I'm already starting to see the implications of automation that's having in my local community and overall. So how are your organizations really looking at that um, as a skill building, but also the CTO for good uh, uh, gathering that could really be impactful in this? So uh, as the first woman to join their organization, um, <laughs> And we just added two more, so that's great. Um, honestly, in the last retreat we had, this was a huge topic of conversation for us. 
And Omar and I uh, decided to work together uh, and we actually surveyed all of our participating organizations because we had a question, how well are we or are we not doing in that way? Uh, so we basically took everybody's information, we rolled it up, we benchmarked that against uh, you know, the big Silicon Valley folks who are uh, now publicizing their information. And honestly, we're doing slightly better, but not good enough. Uh, and so we are actually work, actively working, uh, going out and uh, interviewing, getting help from people. Uh, we're looking at uh, some opportunities from some grant funding to be able to uh, find different sources uh, so that we can hire people uh, you know, of a more diverse nature. Uh, we're talking to boot camps who specialize in that. Um, but this is something that you know, I've personally been very encouraged uh, about in terms of the receptivity of, of the organizations involved. Uh, and I do think, I was talking to somebody earlier in this conference, um, I do think that when people uh, come up through those opportunistic programs, they're actually more likely to want to work for an organization like yours uh, than necessarily going off and making a whole lot of money. Um, they recognize that they were given an opportunity and so the synergy between you know, where they are and their commitment to you and your organization uh, can actually be a, a great marriage going forward. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, and also to the gentleman's question earlier about, uh, you know, we're a small group, but we're really going to put this data on our website, CDOs for Good. We're going to have advice there. We really want to make this as public as possible to help as many other orgs from our own experiences. So that's part of our evolution as well as an organization. I think we have time to squeeze in one last question. Thank you. I'm Hannah. Uh, I had a question. It seems like you guys probably have in-house engineers for a lot of the organizations that are here. They may be thinking, is in-house or contracting out the right decision for their specific topic area or their platform? I was curious if you guys could just speak a bit to how you made that decision and any advice for folks here. Yeah, I mean, we have an in-house staff, and I just like working with in-house engineers much more even after trying out, you know, contracting. And we do actually have a small team in Pakistan that does our mobile app, but even that is difficult to manage. And I think when you get people caught up in the mission, working with product and designers and just seeing the rest of the org, it's much easier for you to innovate and be quicker and sort of do the kind of stuff you want to do. So I've really swung to that side, and I really do not want to contract uh, almost anymore. I've actually been forced to do uh, <laughs> just the opposite in many ways. Um, we probably have 40 product and technical people in our organization, um, but we're working on a very large initiative right now, uh, and uh, we do work with some contract organizations. Um, currently, I'm really trying to reach out. Uh, there's an organization called Andela, uh, if you're familiar with that. Um, <laughs> And we just reached out to them and uh, initiated a contract with them and we're bringing on a couple of their engineers and we're hoping to ramp up uh, a lot more of those types of programs to you know, increase uh, that kind of uh, sourcing and giving people opportunity out there as well. Um, I, think it's, I think it's accurate to say that uh, nine, I think 19 out of our 19 participating orgs have engineering in-house. But what I would also say is that that doesn't mean on site. And one of the ways that some of our orgs have addressed the talent crunch is by doing more uh, remote things. Anyway, that could be a whole discussion unto itself, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I had uh, a, an ideology that I, would, that I would push upon people in terms of in-house versus outsource, but it is intriguing if you think about the orgs that make up our membership and their success to note that, that all of them do it in-house. Well, thank you so much, Omar, CJ, and Oliver, for joining us today. And thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you.